Okay, we're broadcasting. Uh, welcome to the latest edition of Med MedCan Presents. This is the twice weekly webinar series that we do on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 12.30 p.m. Today's guest is MedCan Director of Fitness, Stephen Saltzman, and he's, he's got a fun presentation for us today. I'm excited about this one. Um, Stephen, I'm going to start with your bio. Uh, you completed your Bachelor of Science in Kinesiology at York University, and you've been a certified, a certified personal trainer with the Canadian Society of Exercise Physiology since 2011. Before Stephen was at MedCan, he was a personal training manager at Equinox, where he won the Personal Training Manager of the Year Award. Stephen, how are you today? I'm well. I'm uh, a little bit uh, ready for things to start getting back to normal uh, okay. and doing my best to make sure that the team stays uh, as cohesive as possible and that uh, everybody stays safe and that we get through this thing and come back bigger, better, stronger than ever. That's great. Um, so you have, uh, yeah, you've been at home like everybody else. You've been, uh, you have a two-year-old daughter, right? Uh, how have you been exercising? So uh, admittedly, my workout routine has had to change uh, quite a bit uh, since, since, the, since the lockdown and, and the really limited availability of any type of fitness facility. So some of the things that I've done in my own workouts uh, personally, or to help me stay fit at home mostly, is um, I've definitely upped the amount of cardio that I've been doing, like uh, a, little bit, a little bit more walking, but a, a, quite a bit more running, and then making sure that I'm doing the preparatory or the prehab work uh, in between those runs. Uh, to avoid anything like an overuse injury. And then um, uh, uh, just as important uh, when we're talking about staying fit at home is to make sure that your, uh, your calorie intake and your food choice reflects any changes in the amount of physical activity that you've been doing or the amount of calories that you're burning. That's fantastic. Uh, oh, we already have a question. That's great. Uh, Okay, well, I, uh, I think we should just throw it open to your presentation. So folks, what we're gonna do uh, today, Stephen's gonna walk through um, uh, a bit of a, a how-to, um, how to work out at home through physical distancing and uh, everything you need to know about you know, fitness at home. And then uh, we'll take questions after that. Stephen, why don't you just kind of launch in and um, uh, yeah, we've already got uh, some questions and we'll work from there. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm gonna, briefly go over uh, some of the stuff that I mentioned in my uh, Eat, Move, Think podcast episode, uh, which started talking about uh, doing or finding the best way to stay fit at home uh, right when this whole uh, pandemic and isolation really began. And there's a couple of uh, themes or guiding principles that I laid out in that podcast that I'll kind of summarize for everybody here. Um, and maybe it'll even answer or even better spur a couple of uh, a couple of questions that we'd be happy to take. Um, as many of you know, there's some people feel as though uh, working out is um, just overwhelming, not because it's necessarily difficult to do, but because they're not exactly sure what to do. And there's so many pieces of equipment, there's so many different exercises and variations that for some people it may even be something like a non-starter. Um, and they just don't know what the heck they could do because you, know, you have to think about how many sets do I do? How many reps do I do? Which exercise do I do? How much rest do I have? Do I not injure myself? What, you, you could just go on and on. But one of the key uh, pieces that I spoke about in the Eat, Move, Think podcast was that you have basically two things that you can vary uh, to maximize the effectiveness of any type of workout, but especially one at home where you're limited in other ways. Uh, the first one of them is the intensity at which you're working at, okay? And that's important, and it's also, it, it also rings true, especially when you're in isolation, because you're limited in your equipment uh, for the most part, um, and you have all of these other limitations, but one thing that you do have in your control is the intensity at which you're working. So you can do a simple exercise with not a lot of equipment, but what's going to be really important is that whatever you choose to do, you do it to the point where 
you are essentially fatigued. If you're going to do push-ups, let's say, let's use a very general example, and you do a set of 10 push-ups, that's great. It's better than doing nothing. Is it going to necessarily make you uh, better, stronger, or fitter than, it, than, it, uh, than you were before? Maybe, maybe not. If you finish 10 push-ups and I ask, how many more can you do? And your answer is, oh, I could probably do about 20 more if I really had to, then those push-ups are going to have a really minimal effect on any type of fitness changes that you have. However, if you push yourself and work at a, at a higher intensity to the point where you're doing push-ups until you get fatigued, all of a sudden, that same exercise is going to stimulate muscles and, and muscle tissue in your body to either, at the very least, stay the same, or in, in, a, in a good case, in an ideal case, get better. Because it all comes from your body's um, uh, ability to adapt. And so what you have to do is put it in a scenario or a situation where you're forcing it to adapt, where you cannot do another rep and you're at failure and all of a sudden the muscles involved are like, uh oh, uh, I can't do what he or she wants me to do. I need to get better, I need to change, right? So that's the one thing that um, I really focused on in that Eat, Move, Think podcast is the intensity that you're working at. And then another guiding principle that I spoke about uh, with a little bit of detail was how you pair your exercises. Um, and what I mean by that is you can strategically pick the order of exercises that you're going to do, and that can have an effect on how beneficial that workout is going to be. So for example, you can think of some very basic exercises, like let's say uh, a push-up, a row, a squat, and something like a, like a deadlift or a kettlebell swing, something where you're really using your hips and your glutes, where that's the dominant muscle. You can do them in any order you like, really, but you can get even more benefit from the exact same exercises, same number of reps, same weight, except putting the exercises in a different order. So the, uh, the, the, the foundation that I used in that podcast was essentially pairing an upper body push, like a push up, with a lower body pull or hip dominant exercise. And if you're gonna do exercises back to back, that's how you should pair them, upper body push with lower body pull. And then conversely, an upper body pull, like something like a row, with a lower body push or squat based or knee dominant exercise. Okay, so those are two of the main guiding principles that we talked about in the podcast. They hold true whether you're working with your trainer in the gym or if you're working out under less ideal circumstances at home, but it could potentially be even more important at home because you really have to make the most of the workout that you do. That's great, Stephen. Uh, well, so, so moving in, you, um, uh, you were talking about uh, – uh, pairing exercises and and so how do you apply that if, you know if you were actually going to move into what an actual workout would look like can you walk through that yeah absolutely so I'll, I'll, I'll stick to those same four exercises because they're pretty universal and to kind of just work through uh, or talk through what that would look like so you have your push-up you have your row you have your squat and you have your hip based deadlift or kettlebell swing or hip dominant exercise so you would do uh, a set of push-ups and then right away, follow that up with a set of either glute bridges or kettlebell swings or deadlifts, a hip dominant exercise. And then you can go back and forth between those two exercises, almost like a superset. So you do the push-ups and then right away go to the glute dominant exercise and then take a rest. And then do that two or three times, however many sets you, 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 you are capable of, uh, of, of handling. And then your second pairing of exercises would be something like a row. Um, or a pull up if you have the if you have the equipment to do so, uh, and then you pair that with a squat. So it could be a body weight squat, it could be a one legged squat, it could be a split squat, a lunge, you name it. Uh, but that's and then you would go through those two exercises back to back. You almost pair them together like that, doing one exercise, then going right to the other, then having a little bit of rest before r rinsing and repeating essentially. That's fantastic. I you know I. Uh... I think in the actual question session, I'm going to ask you to demonstrate a glute bridge uh, because actually I don't think a lot of people would know what that is. But anyway, yeah, why don't we uh, move on to your next um, your next section? Um, okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'll kind of tie into 
uh, that last answer that I gave, and I'm actually going to answer one of the uh, one of the questions here. Uh, what would you use for a row if you don't have the equipment? Uh, almost irrespective of who you ask, the back exercise or pulling types of exercises are going to be some of the toughest to do with little to no equipment. Uh, everything else you can kind of figure out. Uh, it's a little bit more intuitive, but the back exercises are going to be much tougher. Um, and not all of us are, 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 are fortunate enough to have exercise equipment at home or in some cases even a full-fledged gym. Um, but the good news is, is that with just a little bit of creativity and some of the things that you can find laying around your house, you can absolutely uh, uh, target those muscles and still get a decent workout. Um, and so what I've brought here is an example of that. Uh, it could be something as simple as either a knapsack or my trusty MedCan duffel bag over here. Uh, you fill it up with whatever you with whatever you have laying around the house uh, to get to a, a, a your desired weight. So you can think like textbooks, water bottles, you name it, and then this bag essentially becomes your dumbbell. Um, and you can actually repurpose this for a couple of other exercises that you might not right away realize that, oh wow, I can make it a little bit more challenging with little to nothing. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna turn the camera a little bit so you have a little bit better perspective uh, of the gym floor and I'll demonstrate a couple of the exercises. The first is gonna be a one arm row. And essentially what I'm gonna be doing is going through a couple of different variations where I'm doing it with one arm. And then I'm also gonna do it with two arms and changing my stance and just showing you a bunch of different ways that you can target those back muscles uh, with just my trusty duffel bag. So one second, I'm just gonna turn it a little bit. And I'll wheel the bench over here so it's a little bit easier or a little bit uh, clearer for me to talk. So what I'm gonna do is essentially use a chair everybody's got a chair at home and I have my duffel bag which is full of books trust me it's heavy uh, I'm gonna keep a flat back I'm gonna stabilize myself with one arm on the chair and I'm gonna keep my arm with the weight nice and close to my body and I'm just gonna pull up and repeat pull up and repeat and one thing that you can pay attention to is that you want to keep your shoulder away from the ear so avoid uh, avoid shrugging your shoulder, keep the shoulder away from your ear, all the way down, and pull, keeping the arm nice and close. There you go. And then it's as simple as that to uh, do it on, to just switch sides. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna lower the perspective here a little bit. And for something that's a little bit more challenging for the core, and again, feel free to, um, add or take away weight as you deem necessary. What I'm gonna do is actually in that same position, I'm just gonna lose the chair, keep a flat back, grab that bag with both hands now, and I'm gonna pull into my belly button, remembering the same principles of keeping the shoulder away from the ear and keeping the arms nice and close to the body. Stephen, can you back up a little bit from the, I think, yeah, that's, okay, that's perfect. That's great. Absolutely. So arms nice and close to the body, pull to the belly button and back down, keeping the shoulder away from the ear. So I'll give you a side. side yeah, push. that's perfect. You're, and is your back, uh, your back looks at uh, like a 45 degree angle. Is that what you're trying to hit there? So it, it's, it's more or less a 45 degree angle at the hip. Right, that's the joint that I'm really worried about. And then I just wanna make sure that my lower back, I avoid things like arching too much. Okay. Right, so that everything is nice and flat. So if you think like you're sitting in good posture or standing in good posture, keep that the same and bend at the hip. And you're in a great position. Perfect. Okay, well let's um uh, let's shift into the questions uh, because I think we we have some. Or, or do you have anything else? To, do you want to shift into the questions? Uh, sure. Yeah, let's do yeah. it. Okay. 
Okay, so we have another question. What's a good workout that would be beneficial for me, but also engage my kids? I find when I try to get them to exercise, it's not a workout for me. Okay, that's interesting. I mean, I, I, uh, I do struggle with that uh, myself in, in my own house. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is, this is really where you start, gotta start getting creative. And I think that the, the best way to do this and keep the kids engaged, because that's gonna be a very, very important part of this, um, is it's actually better to do a little bit less intense of a workout in this scenario and have it last a little bit longer by keeping the kids engaged uh, than to just go crazy that's something with something that's too much like a traditional workout. The kids get bored and all of a sudden now they want to go back inside or they want to do something else or watch TV. So I think that it starts with uh, keeping the kids in mind and getting back to our roots of just playing. Uh, Anything that you're going to be doing is, uh, I would challenge you to think about it in terms of positioning it as a game to your kids. Um, maybe this is something like keep away. Uh, it could be something as simple as tag. Uh, it could be something as simple as riding your bike. And perhaps you're forced to do a uh, different gear than what your kids are doing. So it's a little bit easier and more fun for them. Yet you're going for a little bit of a workout. Um, and then also, uh, you know, obviously we have to make sure that we're maintaining social distancing. Um, but if you have the ability to go on a walk with people that you, that you live with, so obviously we don't want to break any of the rules. Uh, but if you, could, if you have the opportunity to go for a walk with the people that you uh, already live with, uh, feel free to um, perhaps push yourself a little bit more and play those same types of chasing, running, tag type games up and down a hill. Um, and, and anything that where you can get a bunch uh, or the, the maximum amount of muscle activated. So make sure that it's something that involves your legs and running. Uh, additionally, I mean, it could be something as simple as if the kids are away or not away, but if the kids are occupied in your home, uh, something as simple as up and down the stairs can be uh, really, really beneficial and activate a lot of muscle tissue. We, you know, we've, um, we've been having fun doing the, I mean, there, God, there's so many workouts on social media, but um, the MedCan trainers are doing workouts at, uh, at Instagram, um, at MedCan LiveWell. And we've been having fun uh, following along with those. Um, uh, that's, I, I don't know, just, you know, finding, finding some way to make it fun for the kids. So if you're a little goofy as you're doing the, uh, the exercises, that, uh, that can be fun. And it can be fun to have like, you know, four people in a living room following along to somebody who's on uh, a little Instagram screen. That can be fun. Uh, and, and you can, I mean, this is kind of crazy, but uh, like wearing kind of, you know, costumes or something is, it can make exercise fun too. Uh, uh, we had a thing where we dressed up like uh, aerobics instructors from the eighties, uh, which I'm making myself maybe sound silly, but it was fun <laughs> for the kids actually. Or, like, you know uh, what? No, but, but just leaping, you know, leapfrogging off of that. I mean, maybe doing something, uh, watching Instagram um, is already enough to perhaps keep some of the kids engaged, but maybe everybody does it in their Halloween costumes, right? <laughs> Uh, you know, anything to, to mix it up a little bit and, you know, just, Hey, this is different. I want to try that. And maybe you can get a 30 minute or, or, you know, closer to a 60 minute workout in with the kids happy than you otherwise would have been. And then there's always, I mean, I would never necessarily recommend this in a session. Um, but you know, if, if, if no one's looking, I mean, the kids can be weights, right? Uh, you know, you can pick them up and do all sorts of fun things with them in the, uh, under the umbrella of play. Uh, I mean, you could, I, I, I got a two-year-old at home and, you know, he thinks it's the best thing in the world when I do push-ups and he's sitting on my back. Yeah, I still, I, my six-year-old, uh, I, I'm getting to the point where it's hard to do like six or seven with uh, my six-year-old on my back. All right, but, then uh, he's, he's going on your shoulders and you're doing squats. <laughs> that's, oh, that's a great idea, actually. I'm going to use that, uh, that is a great idea. The, I mean, the thing I like about this question, though, is the fact that the questioner is asking how to engage kids in exercise, because I do feel like that is so uh, important on a mental health perspective, that if the kids don't, you know, kids, you sort of do have to run them. 
uh, they're almost like you know dogs or horses where they do need their exercise uh, every day uh, or they go a little nuts. And so uh, I think it is really important in, in trying to be creative when uh, you engage with them is a good idea. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that it, 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 it's, it, in, in many respects, it's how you frame it. And so if you can uh, think about how to frame things in, uh, in terms of that it's a game or that it's a competition with another sibling in some way, shape or form, you can, you can quite often get them quite a bit more motivated uh, to not just burn off energy to stay fit and it being good for their mental and physical health, but you know, I know personally that my two-year-old naps and sleeps at night much, much better and is, has a much healthier appetite when he spends the day active. That's great. Yeah, and I think that's, uh, uh, that's absolutely true. Um, I'm going to start uh, to some of the pre-submitted questions. Um, you sort of dealt with this, uh, Stephen, but uh, we're okay, let's talk about it. I've been running about three to four times a week, the questioner asks. What other exercises should I do to complement this and how often? That's a good question. Yeah, absolutely. So you're gonna, I'm going to answer that with exercises that are going to fall into two big categories. One is you, you're, you're, you're essentially contracting uh, specific muscles in a specific plane of movement when you're running, and it's called the sagittal plane. Um, and so what you want to do is you want to stretch the muscles that you use for running, so your quads, uh, your hip flexors, and you want to make sure that you're running in good posture. So just a general uh, lower body stretch is going to be good to complement the workout, and that can be done uh, before and after the, the actual run itself. Um, but then just as importantly, because it's a a uh, little bit lower intensity, uh, long duration type of exercise, you want to make sure that you are balancing the planes of motion. So what I mean by that is if running is done, you can think of it, the sagittal plane is moving in the forward and back plane. So if you had a, 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 a piece of glass that split your body in half down the middle, right? Um, running is done in that plane right? It's, move, it's moving like this. So you want to make sure that you're doing uh, exercises that go or move you through what's called the frontal plane. So think of it like running sideways almost, which is perpendicular to running just straight forward. Um, and then also uh, the, um, the transverse plane. So exercises that incorporate you can almost think of it like three-dimensional movement or moving in a diagonal direction, okay? So again, I'll, I'll demo that a little bit just for some quick examples of what I mean by that. So running is all done in the forward and back plane, right? It's all done this way. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that you're doing things in other ways of moving. So a good way to complement what's going on with running is to all of a sudden now move in the frontal plane. So I'm taking a, a big wide stance for my squat and instead of a traditional body weight squat, I'm going nice and wide, turning my feet out at a 45 degree angle and squatting this way. Mm, okay. Alternatively, another one is a curtsy lunge or a curtsy squat where I essentially, let me move back just a little bit more. I put one foot behind the other, keep my shoulders square. And then the other way. Right. So all of a sudden now you're working all of the muscles that uh, would essentially not be involved too much in just running in a straight line. Um, there's a symphony of muscles that uh, articulate the hip and the knee and all of them have to be in tune. Otherwise, you're you're more likely to get pain eventually. And you start to see things like overuse injuries. And many of them come from either uh, poor gait, uh, which by extension is muscles that are all of a sudden out of balance, affecting the, the actual kinetics of the way that you walk, uh, and making sure that you don't forget about any muscles by moving in different directions can help eliminate those and keep other things stretched that should be stretched and strengthened that should be strengthened. That's, uh, my wife and I were riding, uh, we were running through the X, uh, the C and E the other, uh, the other day and we saw somebody, 
um, doing side, uh, like a shuffle, side shuffle, going uh, through the parking lot. I don't, it's a, it, there's this solitary person doing side shuffles through the CNE parking lot is just a, and we thought, what, but basically they were doing what you suggest, which is move in a different plane. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, next question. I used to swim because it was easy on my joints. Uh, my knees can't take a lot of pressure, but a great workout. Without being able to swim, I am feeling out of shape and it's affecting my body and my spirit. What could I do instead? So I'll, I'll give you kind of an ideal scenario, which is picking a piece of equipment that, um, of cardio equipment that is a little bit easier on the knees outside of, you know, something like, let's say a treadmill. And that would be something like an upright or recumbent bike or something like a, um, like an elliptical machine. Uh, so those would be my, you know, under normal circumstances, that would be uh, one alternative. Um, the other alternative is to, um, not so much even focus on the knees, but worry about activating muscle in the lower body um, and then complementing that with upper body. Because I understand that, that being able to swim gives you that sense of freedom and that sense of, um, that, uh, of accomplishment and you get the, the, the positive hormones and juices flowing from an exercise. But you can mimic that by activating muscle tissue. The, the, the activated muscle tissue releases those chemicals, those happy chemicals, regardless of the type of exercise. They don't care whether you're swimming or whether you're walking upstairs. I know that's tough on the knees, but as long as they're being activated in some way, they, they don't care what you're doing. If they're being used, they're gonna, you're gonna get those positive benefits. And so what I'll do is I'll loop back to a question that we had a little bit uh, earlier that I didn't quite answer. And what I'll do is I'll give you some examples of uh, exercises that uh, will activate the glutes. So things like a uh, glute bridge uh, or, or just a very simple deadlift. And I can use them or I can use that same, that same duffel bag that we were using for the rows. Usually you're going to need a little bit more weight. For something like this because you actually got a lot of strength in your group in your glutes relative to your back but I'll demo a couple of quick exercises that you can do and I want you to pay attention uh, what's happening at my knee specifically and what you'll notice is if I'm doing these correctly there's going to be almost no movement in the knee and the knee itself the angle that the knee is going to be at is in a much less provocative position than in something like a squat especially if you're doing it to um, to to a full or proper depth. So I'll just demo yeah. those two quickly. Okay, so you're gonna demo demo the deadlift and then demo, are you gonna the glute do the bridge. glute bridge? Yeah. Okay, perfect, great. So for the deadlift, you're essentially picking something up off the ground. Let me just move this out of the way here so that I can see what I'm doing. So I'm gonna move this over here. Now, again, pay attention to what's happening at the knee. The knee joint, is not going to be bending too much. But what I'm going to be doing is keeping my back flat, reaching for my toes, grabbing onto that duffel bag, and then consciously clenching my glutes as hard as I can to lift the bag. I'm not going to go too far back. I'm going to go to a nice, tall, standing, good posture, and then lower it back down. Again, the back is flat. I'm essentially aiming to pick up and put down the bag right in front of my toes and I'm clenching my glutes as hard as I can to get this done. And again, if you notice, the, there's not much that's happening at the knee. The hip is the primary mover here, which is good because you're activating the most amount of muscle tissue. Now, if that's a more advanced exercise given your fitness level, I'll give you a couple of different examples of what something like a glute bridge looks like, which activates the same muscle tissue, except gets joints out of the equation and makes it a little bit simpler. So the first most regressed version of this is just a simple glute bridge on the floor. I'm gonna lay down, bend my knees, clench my glutes to lift my hips up off the ground, and that looks like this. Feet about shoulder width apart, and I'm just going to clench my glutes to lift my hips up off the, off the ground. 
and that's the muscle doing the movement. If I want to start progressing this, I can do a single leg. And alternatively, I can take that same duffel bag, carefully place it over the hips, and do the same thing with some resistance. If you have a chair or an edge of a bed, a further progression before the deadlift that I demoed before would be something like a hip thrust, which starts off similarly with my shoulder blades on the bench, feet shoulder width apart, and then clench my glutes. Uh, okay. And if you notice, my knee isn't involved here and my ankles aren't involved. There's really only one joint that's doing any of the locomotion. From there, feel free, add some resistance, and go to town. That's fantastic. And again, I understand that that doesn't look at all like swimming. <laughs> you're going to get the benefits of activating that muscle tissue. And what you can do is, if you're looking for it to more replace swimming than do a resistance type workout, lower the weight and do reps. Instead of doing reps, you can even think about as I'm gonna do as many as I can in one minute or two minutes or three minutes. Take a quick rest and do it again. Uh, so St Steven, if you were, I, because we're coming up, um, we're, we're technically out of time, but I'm just gonna uh, just quickly, can you put together a, uh, so if you were gonna pair how many workouts, how many exercises is enough? And, and can you structure a workout uh, just kind of quickly, like, you know, say, okay, it's glute bridge and, and X, you know, pairing them. Um, back yeah, absolutely. So obviously, I, you know, I put this out there that um, we're, the first thing that I would do if, if I was working with a client is I would do some type of movement screen. So all of these suggestions that I'm, that I'm going to give are going to assume that you don't have any contraindicated uh, injuries or, or, you know, less than ideal movement patterns. So I'll just put that disclaimer out there. But let's assume that you moved relatively well and there weren't any injuries that were currently affecting your ability to exercise. Essentially what I would do, and you feel free to, to mix up the order or the, uh, the, the order of the, that we're doing these, is pair a push-up with a glute bridge or a hip thrust like I just demonstrated, okay? And I would do push-ups to fatigue because that's a self-limiting exercise. You're, you're gonna get tired before you get hurt. And then glute bridges or um, hip thrusts like we just demonstrated so that I can do, I can pick a weight that I can do between, let's say 12 to 15, but I can't do 20. If I can do 20, it's probably a little bit too light. Right. So then I would go back and forth. You can do that anywhere from three to five times. You do the push ups, then the hip thrusts, and then do that little pair five times or three to five times. Take a couple of minutes rest and move on to the row that we did or the two arm row that we did, pairing that with a squat variation. Uh, of your choice. So whether it's just a regular body weight squat, you can use that same, uh, that same uh, duffel bag held across your chest for a little bit of resistance. And again, then pair, or you do those two exercises back to back three to five times. As a very, very bare bones, I didn't use any equipment except for a duffel bag or a knapsack full of books. Um, and you've hit every single muscle in your body, more or less. And if you do enough repetitions and limit the amount of rest that you, that, you, uh, that you do, you will feel your heart rate start to rise and you'll probably even sweat a little bit, which given the circumstances uh, isn't, isn't horrible and it'll help you maintain not just a couple of muscles on your body, but almost all of them. But, but I mean, the actual, and you say this to me all the time, Steve, that uh, the best thing to do is to work with your trainer to get a, uh, a, a workout that is perfect for you. Customization is really important when it comes to exercise. MedCan has a stable of trainers uh, who are available. And in fact, you have some great news. 
um, about the number of fitness uh, virtual training sessions that we've had. You yeah, so about that? absolutely, I'd be happy to. Um, so we have at right now, at any given moment, about 34 personal trainers ready to do uh, virtual personal training sessions. And these guys are incredibly creative with, um, if you thought that you liked some of the things that I was able to cook up with little to no equipment, the, the, the creativity that these guys display is, is a triumph. Um, and then uh, we've actually been uh, doing quite a few of these sessions where we have now um, almost two or 300 different clients who are partaking in virtual personal training. And uh, today we will actually uh, complete our 1,000th uh, virtual personal training session. So a little 1, bit of a milestone. 1,000th? 1, 1, 1, 1,000th will be done today. Gee, that's fantastic. I yeah. That, wow, that's amazing. Good yeah, that's, uh, that's since COVID started, and uh, we, have, we, we have not looked back. Oh, that's great. Um, okay, this is great. Uh, thank you so much. I, uh, so one thing uh, for folks who are watching, we put these up on uh, YouTube um, after. It'll be up later this afternoon or tomorrow. Uh, they'll be available to see on the MedCan YouTube channel. So you just go to YouTube and you can search for MedCan and then you can find your way uh, to, to the webinars. And then I am going to share my screen here for the upcoming, um, Stephen, can you see the screen? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Sir. Okay. So, uh, so that means everybody can see it. So, uh, Tuesday, May 5th, we have Dr. Peter Nord, our chief medical officer is going to be walking through the in-home annual health assessment. Uh, next Thursday, Dr. Andrew Miners is going to be walking through some sports therapy and rehab Q and a, uh, Tuesday, May 12th, we've got back to work the new reality with Dr. Shane Journay. And then uh, Thursday, May 14th, we've got helping your kids through uh, COVID-19. And then we're just keeping going through um, the rest of the month, every Tuesday and Thursday at 12.30 p.m. And then we have a ton of video content over at the MedCan Instagram page, which is at MedCan LiveWell. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing. Stephen, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Um, and uh, yeah, see you next week, folks. My pleasure. Take care, everybody. Stay safe.